morning. If you would, please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Ezra, chapter 1. Ezra, chapter 1. Hopefully we all know how to find Ezra since we were <coughs> last week. Uh, this morning we'll be looking at Ezra, chapters 1 and 2. And before we go any further, if you please join me in prayer. Father, God, as we come before you this morning, we feel the weight of our sin, our guilt, the, the condemnation that we deserve because of our trespasses against you. But far more we feel the joy that we have in you through the work of your Son in forgiving us so much. Lord, we love much because we have been forgiven much. And we feel the, the, the weakness, the inadequacy of our attempts to display, to express the love that we have for you. Our songs should be better. Our prayers should be deeper. Our scripture reading should be more reverent. Our, our sermons should be more faithful. Lord, in, in none of these things can we give you what you deserve. But Lord, we, we trust. We trust that you are honored and that you are pleased. Because we we love you because you first loved us. Father, we ask you would bless us this morning. That as we read and, and examine your word, that you would open our eyes to behold marvelous things out of your word. Lord, that through an ever-increasing knowledge of you, we would ever increase in our love for you and for one another. Lord, that our singing would become better, that our lives would become more holy in, in every respect. Lord, may we ever grow in worship and holiness until that day when we are perfected in your presence forevermore. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The title for this morning's sermon, as it's in the bulletin, is The Theater of God's Glory. I shamelessly plagiarized that from John Calvin in his commentary on the Psalms. God created the world to display His glory. Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. John Calvin also observed in the same time the world is a theater for God's glory. He said, the church is the orchestra, the most conspicuous part. God's glory is displayed primarily through His church, His people. Um, and, and God is telling a story in history, a story centered in what He is doing for His people, a story to display His glory. And Ezra, as, as indeed every part of the history of Scripture, is a part of this story that God is telling. And in Ezra, especially the beginning of Ezra, we see 
the curtain pulled back slightly and we can see how God is working in telling the story. We don't just see the story itself, we see how the story is put together. Um, this morning we'll see three aspects of God as the storyteller, the sovereign author of history. And so let us read the text. Ezra chapter 1 beginning in verse 1. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And let each survivor, in whatever place he sojourns, be assisted by the men of his place with silver and gold, with goods and with beasts, besides free will offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Then rose up the heads of the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit God had stirred to go up to rebuild the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. And all who were about them aided them with vessels of silver, with gold, with goods, with beasts, and with costly wares, besides all that was freely offered. Cyrus the king also brought out the vessels of the house of the Lord that Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem, and placed in the house of his gods. Cyrus, king of Persia, brought these out in the charge of Mithridath, the treasurer, who counted them out to Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. And this was the number of them, 30 basins of gold, 1,000 basins of silver, 29 censers, 30 bowls of gold, 410 bowls of silver, and 1,000 other vessels. All the vessels of gold and of silver were 5,400. All these did Sheshbazar bring up when the exiles were brought up from Babylonia to Jerusalem. Now these were the people of the the province who came up out of the captivity of those exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried captive to Babylonia. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his own town. They came with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Sariah, Reliah, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mizpar, Bigvi, Rehum, and Benah. The number of the men of the people of Israel, the sons of Perosh, 2,172. The sons of Shephathia, 372. The sons of Era, 775. The sons of Pahath Moab, namely the sons of Jeshua and Joab, 2,812. The sons of Elam, 1,254. The sons of Zatu, 945. The sons of Zakkai, 760. The sons of Bani, 642. The sons of Bibai, 623. The sons of Asgad, 1,222. The sons of Adonikam, 666. The sons of Bigvi, 2,056. The sons of Aden, 454. The sons of Atir, namely of Hezekiah, 98. The sons of Bezai, 323. The sons of Jorah, 112. The sons of Hashem, 223. The sons of Gebar, 95. The sons of Bethlehem, 123. The men of Nephtophah, 56. The men of Anathoth, 128. The sons of Asmaveth, 42. The sons of Kiriath Arim, Shephara, and Baroth, 743. The sons of Ramah and Geba, 621. The men of Michmas, 122. The men of Bethel and Ai, 223. The sons of Nebo, 52. The sons of Magbish, 156. The sons of the other Elam, 1,254. The sons of Haram, 320. The sons of Lod, Hadid, and Anno, 725. The sons of Jericho, 345. The sons of Sinah, 3,630. The priests, the sons of Judiah, of the house of Jeshua, 973. The sons of Emer, 1,052. The sons of Pashur, 1,247. The sons of Haram, 1,017. The Levites, the sons of Jeshua and Cadmiel, of the sons of Hodabia, 74. The singers, the sons of Asaph, 128. The sons of the gatekeepers, the sons of Shalom, the sons of Atir, the sons of Talman, the sons of Akub, the sons of Hatita, and the sons of Shobai, in all, 139. 
The temple servants, the sons of Ziha, the sons of Hashifah, the sons of Tabayoth, the sons of Keros, the sons of Siaha, the sons of Padan, the sons of Lebanon, the sons of Hagabah, the sons of Akub, the sons of Hagab, the sons of Shamlai, the sons of Hanan, the sons of Gedal, the sons of Gahar, the sons of Rea, the sons of Rezin, the sons of Nakoda, the sons of Gazam, the sons of Uzza, the sons of Pasia, the sons of Besai, the sons of Asna, the sons of Meunim, the sons of Nephesim, the sons of Bakbuk, the sons of Hakufa, the sons of Harher, the sons of Basluth, the sons of Mehida, the sons of Harsha, the sons of Barkos, the sons of Sisera, the sons of Tima, the sons of Neziah, the sons of Hatifa. The sons of Solomon's servants, the sons of Sotai, the sons of Hasaphereth, the sons of Peruda, the sons of Jala, the sons of Darkon, the sons of Gidel, the sons of Suhathia, the sons of Hatil, the sons of Hokareth, Hasbim, and the sons of Ami. All the temple servants and the sons of Solomon's servants were 392. The following were those who came up from Tel Malah, Tel Harsha, Cherub, Adan, and Emmer, though they could not prove their father's houses or their descent whether they belong to Israel. The sons of Deliah, the sons of Tobiah, the sons of Nakoda, 652. Also of the sons of the priests, the sons of Habiah, the sons of Akaz, and the sons of Barzillai, who had taken a wife from the daughters of Barzillai the Gileadite, and was called by their name. These sought their registration among those enrolled in the genealogies, but they were not found there. And so they were excluded from the priesthood as unclean. The governor told them that they were not to partake of the most holy food, until there should be a priest to consult Urim and Thummim. The whole assembly together was 42,360, besides their male and female servants, of whom there were 7,337, and they had 200 male and female singers. Their horses were 736, their mules were 245, their camels were 435, and their donkeys were 6,720. Some of the heads of families when they came to the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem, made free will offerings for the house of God to erect it on its site. According to their ability, they gave to the treasury of the work 61,000 derricks of gold, 5,000 minas of silver, and 100 priestly garments. Now the priests, the Levites, some of the people, the singers, the gatekeepers, and the temple servants lived in their towns, and all the rest of Israel in their towns. This is the word of the Lord. The entire Bible is a story of God, and God is the sovereign author of His story. Indeed, not only the entire Bible, all of history is the story of God, and God is the sovereign author of His story. This is nowhere clearer than here in the first chapter of Ezra. As I said, we'll see three aspects of God's sovereign authorship. First, in the words of our Confession of Faith, the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith, say that God has sovereignly decreed all things whatsoever come to pass. That's ancient, archaic English. So to put it another way, I don't think it sounds as nice, but it's much more easily understood. God alone decides what happens in His story. God decides what happens in His story. Which means God alone decides what happens in history. Notice how the book of Ezra begins. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. Ezra is referencing Jeremiah 29.10. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. This isn't a prediction. It's a promise. God isn't looking forward in time and seeing that 70 years from now, this man named Cyrus is going to become the ruler over Babylon and going to send the Jews back to Jerusalem. God is making a promise that He will bring them back to this place. 
In Isaiah 45, verse 1, Cyrus is mentioned by name, and God promises to take him by the hand so that he would order the rebuilding of the temple and of Jerusalem. God even says, Cyrus, my shepherd. And that's why unbelieving biblical scholars say that, well, Isaiah had to have been written by two separate people, and the second Isaiah had to have written after the return from exile. We disagree. God is causing these things to happen. He's, he's not just foretelling the future. He's, he's foretelling, this is what I'm going to do. It's like if you are watching a play or listening to a, um, a, a symphony and you're sitting next to the playwright or the author or the composer and, and they tell you what's about to happen next. You know, this next movement is, is going to be amazing. The trumpets are going to come. Or, you know, you're not going to believe what this guy's about to do. It, it's not because they're watching it and they just have figured out what's going to happen next. It's because they have determined what's going to happen next. They, they know because they wrote it. And so they can tell you with confidence what will happen. God can tell Jeremiah, in 70 years, I'm going to bring you back to this place because I've decided this is what I am going to do. And so here in Ezra, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus. Again, God didn't just see that well, Cyrus is going to have this idea that he should send the Jews back to Jerusalem. Why does Cyrus send them back? Because the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus to order the rebuilding of the temple. This stirring doesn't eliminate or violate human will or volition, but it does so effectively move Cyrus's heart that Cyrus decides he's going to issue this decree. He, he feels, yes, I should do this. This is a great idea. I want to do this. I'm going to do this. That's why Proverbs writes that the heart of the king is like streams of water in the hands of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. So the Lord stirs up the spirit of Cyrus, and Cyrus issues this decree, verses 2 through 4. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And let each survivor in whatever place he sojourns be assisted by the men of his place with silver and gold, with goods and with beasts, besides free will offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Cyrus, Cyrus issues this decree because the Lord had determined and declared that Cyrus would issue this decree. And so he stirs up his heart to issue this decree. A pagan king who never converts to Judaism, never becomes a true worshiper of God, still issues this decree honoring the Lord and ordering the rebuilding of the temple. And God isn't done directing history. Yet yeah, he, he's not only determined and stirred up Cyrus to issue this decree, he's also sovereign in determining who would return. Look at verse 5. Then rose up the heads of the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit God had stirred to go up to rebuild the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. Cyrus did not order anyone individually to return to Jerusalem. He did not say, okay, you Jews living in this city, you're going to go. He didn't order all the Jews in my empire, go back to Jerusalem. He said, whoever wants to go, whoever is among you of all the people, whoever desires to go, return. They were free to stay. They were free to return. Who went back to Jerusalem? It wasn't all the Jews. A number of them stayed in 
Persia, or what had been Babylon. Life was safe in Persia. It was comfortable in Persia. They, they didn't have autonomy. They were definitely a minority. But they were safe. They were comfortable. Whereas Jerusalem and Judah had, had become this wild and, and dangerous place full of bandits. And other dangers. And enemies. They were coming back to a city that had been destroyed. And a temple that had been destroyed. A hard and difficult task lay ahead of them. And, and who was it that would leave civilization to go to the wilderness... Those whose spirit God had stirred to go up and rebuild the house. They returned because they wanted to return. They wanted to return because God had stirred up their spirits. And that's the only difference between those who stayed and those who went back to Judah. It was the work of God in their hearts, stirring or not stirring. It had nothing to do with who was well off in Persia and who was poor and looking for a better life. It had, had nothing to do with who thought they could gain a better position in Jerusalem, were their hearts stirred by the Lord. People act according to their desires, but their desires are under the control of God, who has decreed in Himself from all eternity, by the most wise and holy counsel of His will, freely and unchangeably, all things whatsoever come to pass. It's the first paragraph of the third chapter of our Confession of Faith. You might think that, that this is an overstatement. Yes, this passage clearly shows God declaring this event and stirring up hearts to fulfill what He has declared in this event. But can we really say whatsoever comes to pass? All things that happen? Absolutely everything? And we say yes, absolutely everything. In Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10, the Lord declares, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from long ago things not yet done, saying my counsel will stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. And in Ephesians 1, 11, it's, it's even more clear as God is named as the one who works all things according to the counsel of His will. All things according to the counsel of His will. Everything. Whatsoever comes to pass, it is done according to the counsel of God's will. If you're looking for some way to fill the hours this afternoon. Go home and meditate on that truth. God works all things together according to the counsel of His will. God has determined all things whatsoever come to pass. God is the author of all history. He's not merely recording the choices and actions of others like a historian would do. Rather, he is determining the storyline. He's bringing characters together. He is, he is superintending their actions to bring everything to his determined conclusion. And I, I promise you this, the climax of the stories is far greater than anything ever created by human imagination. The conclusion is, is far better and longer than, than any happily ever after in any story you've ever heard. And, and even more importantly, this story is true. The story of God is the true story of reality. It's, it's the truest thing in all the world. It's truer than the world itself. And God is writing this story. Once we, we understand that God is the sovereign author of history, that He is determining all things whatsoever come to pass, then we, we can also see 
the manner in which God is writing his story. God's story, like most good stories, like most good music, contains repeating variations on a theme. Think about the songs we've sung this morning. Right? Each one has a tune, and the tune repeats itself. Try sometime to sing a song where the tune changes for each verse. I couldn't do it. Stories repeat themes. Music repeats themes. History repeats themes. It, it doesn't repeat itself exactly, but the same themes or, or images, ideas, same individual stories occur again and again, leading up to the, the climax, the finale. And the theme being repeated here in Ezra chapter 1 is the theme of the Exodus. The Exodus itself, in some ways, echoes the, the earlier call that God made to Abraham to leave Ur and come to a land that I am to show you, and I will make you a great nation there. But after the, the children of Jacob travel to Egypt, they grow, they become enslaved, but God calls them out of Egypt. He raises up a shepherd, Moses, to lead his people out of Egypt and into the promised land. He influences Pharaoh's heart, hardening Pharaoh's heart, so that he might display his glory and his power over Pharaoh. And as the Israelites leave, they plunder the Egyptians. Their owners, their masters, freely gave the Israelites the wealth that they asked for in Exodus 12:36. When the Israelites are instructed to build the tabernacle, the people freely offer their possessions and their wealth for its construction. And here in Ezra, we see those themes repeated again. The people have been defeated and taken into exile. They've lost their freedom, their liberty, their autonomy. But God is leading them out of this foreign land back into their homeland. God has raised up a shepherd to bring the people out. This time not an Israelite, raised in the royal family of Egypt, but the ruler himself. It's raised up as the shepherd. The, the ruler's heart is influenced, moved by God, not hardened as Pharaoh was, but stirred up by God to do the will of God. But in both cases, to display the glory of God over human kings. And as the Jews leave Babylon in, in verse 6, all who were about them aided them with vessels of silver, with gold, with goods, with beasts, and with costly wares, besides all that was freely offered. Again, the former captors are plundered by the departing captives through freely offered gifts. And again, as, as the people come to the work of rebuilding the temple, that the people give generously of their own possessions to finance the work. We see that at the end of chapter 2, verses 68 and 69. Some of the heads of families, when they came to the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem, made free will offerings for the house of God to erect it on its site. According to their ability, they gave to the treasury of the work 61,000 derricks of gold, 5,000 minas of silver, and 100 priestly garments. All, all these themes are repeated again. It's, it's not the exact same thing happening all over again. But the same kinds of things. The idea is repeated. We should see the return from exile as another exodus. And these repeated themes of God's story aren't just repetition for the sake of repetition. They're repeated themes leading to a climax. And that climax is found in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Jesus is a prophet like Moses, but he's greater than Moses. John tells us, he makes this comparison directly, the law came through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the shepherd of God's people like Cyrus. He is a king like Cyrus, but he is greater and better than Cyrus. Jesus is much more highly exalted than Cyrus. His, his kingdom is far greater than Cyrus. When, when Cyrus claims it, God has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. 
Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords who will reign forever and ever. Jesus does far more for God's people than Cyrus does. Moses led them out of captivity in Egypt. Cyrus frees the people from their captivity in Babylonia. Jesus frees his people from slavery to Satan, to sin, and to death. Moses led the people into the land of Canaan, a land flowing with milk and honey. Cyrus allowed the people to return to that land. Jesus brings his people into the heavenly Jerusalem, the true promised land, the dwelling place of God, where we will see his face and be with him forever, where tears will be no more. When the Israelites left Egypt, they and Babylon, they plundered the wealth of their captors. But through Jesus Christ, God richly blesses us with every good gift to enjoy in this world. But He also gives us His Word and His Spirit and His presence, His, his fellowship, His friendship, and His love. Treasures greater far than anything, than everything in this world. When, when we leave this world the system of this world to follow Christ, we, we do suffer loss. But Jesus said rightly in Mark 10, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. We, we might, we do lose some things in following Christ. But the wealth we gain, even in this life, is so much greater than what we lose. And it's not even worth comparing with what awaits us in eternity. The great King Jesus has issued a decree. Pharaoh said to Moses at the end, take the people and go. Get out of my sight. Cyrus decreed, return, whoever desires to go, return to Jerusalem and rebuild this house. Jesus' decree is summarized in Mark chapter 1 verse 15. Repent and believe in the gospel. Jesus has made provision for you to leave your bondage and enter into paradise. He hasn't merely commanded others to aid you in your return like Cyrus did, but he has paid the price to redeem you from sin with his own precious blood. The true, the final, the greatest exodus is when Jesus Christ leads his people out of slavery to sin into His heavenly kingdom forever and ever. And He stirs up hearts to go. Is God stirring up your heart to follow Him? Will you leave behind the comfortable, the familiar, the seemingly safe, but ultimately soul-destroying life of sin in which we were all born, so we might take hold of that which is truly life? Or will you remain comfortable in your sin, separated from God, and in the end receive the full wages of your sin, eternal death and condemnation? Would you rather remain in Babylon than return to the promised land? This leads me to my, my last point. I hope you've already realized it, but I want to make it crystal clear. God's story is your story. God's story is your story. It's not a story distinct from yourself, external to yourself. It's not a story for you to read or hear and be amused at or encouraged by or informed 
by. It's the story of your life. And this should be both the most humbling and the most exalting truth that you ever understand. It's humbling because we have to accept that we are supporting characters. We, we are not the heroes. We're not the main character. Jesus Christ is the hero of our story. He's the center. We are not. He is the theme of heaven's praises. And we are those called together to sing his praise. Can you say with John the Baptist, he must increase and I must decrease? If, if you cannot say that, you will never be a happy Christian. But if you can, you will find that in this displacement of yourself from the center, you will find far more fulfillment and joy and meaning and purpose than you ever imagined possible. If your heart rebels at this humiliation, if you're not willing to move to the side of being a, to be a supporting character in the story of God's glory, there, there is another part you can play. Instead of being rescued by God and living for His glory, you can reject His grace. You can oppose God's will and try to become the captain of your fate and the master of your soul. But you will fail. You will have chosen to side with the dragon rather than the knight in shining armor. You will remain a willing slave to Satan, and you will be cast into the lake of fire forever and ever, while every right-thinking person looks upon you and declares, see the fool who would not make God his refuge. See the one who would not accept God's grace. And the most galling thing to those who make that choice, is they haven't even succeeded in their purpose of rejecting God's glory. Because as they suffer forever, they still serve as a display of God's glory. As He displays His wrath and power in punishing sin and sinners. In either case, God's story and God's glory advance. But the difference for you is literally heaven and hell. We are the creation and He is the Creator. And we cannot have the center place. But at the same time that we're humbled by God's central place in His story, we are exalted in the part that we play in God's story. We are supporting characters, but we are absolutely essential to the narrative. We are not minor side plots in God's grand story of history. There's a reason why I read all of Ezra 2. You know how many people would just skip over that when they preach through Ezra? Because who wants to just have this list of names and numbers that we don't know anything about? That no one knows anything about. We know a little tiny bit about Sheshbazar and Zerubbabel. If Jeshua is the same as Joshua the high priest, we know a little bit about him. But the rest of these, even this Nehemiah here in Ezra 2 2, that's not the same Nehemiah as one who centers in the book of Nehemiah. We don't know anything about these people. But, but they are absolutely essential to the story of God. They are the chosen of God, redeemed to be a display of God's glory. They, as we in the church, are part of the body of Christ, part of the bride of of Christ, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a people for God's own possession, that we might display the excellencies of Him who called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. There is no higher purpose. There is no greater role. You, you could make millions of dollars. You could become a world-famous athlete. 
people could stop talking about Pele and Ronaldo and Messi and start talking about Manny Fords. You could become the leader of the free world. Or of the unfree world. None of it would be nearly so significant as having the lowest place in God's redemptive narrative. We err when we think that only the people that human history remembers are important. And we, we do this even in the church. If we think about the 1800s and, and the work of God in the 1800s in the English-speaking world, because that's what most of us are familiar with, we think of Charles Spurgeon. And I mean, he, he was, in human terms, tremendously important. But Charles Spurgeon was an instrument used by God, just as every Christian in the world in the 1800s was. The story didn't depend upon Charles Spurgeon. It depended upon the sovereign will of God. And the same with Whitfield and Wesley and, and Edwards in the 1700s. Uh, the same with, with John Calvin and Martin Luther in the Reformation. It didn't depend upon Martin Luther for the Protestant Reformation to happen. It depended upon God. To us, so many of these people okay, in those periods of history are, are just blank spaces. We don't know even that they existed. Or others, like the names here, it, it's just names and numbers. And we don't know anything about them. But to God, they are those chosen and called and loved and used to display His glory. They don't need to be known to the world. They are known to God. They are those of whom the world is not worthy. And what else matters? Are, are you willing to be anonymous for the sake of Christ? Will you obey Him and love Him and serve Him with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind and all of your strength, even if no one knows your name? No one but God. No one but the God who has loved us and called us and chosen to display His glory through us. Jesus told His disciples not to rejoice that the spirits are subject to them, but rather to rejoice that their names are written in heaven. I think I can rightly apply that to tell you not to rejoice if your name is well known among men. Not if you're respected among men. Man, but to rejoice that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. This is the greatest honor. This is the highest glory. You are united with Christ. His glory is displayed in you and His glory is shared with you. In you, through you. Nothing could be greater than this. From the perspective of human history... The story recorded in Ezra and Nehemiah is a tiny footnote in the history of the Persian Empire. It never makes it into history textbooks. And it's not because the, the people writing the textbooks are just biased against biblical history. It, it's because looking at the Persian Empire from human history is an absolutely insignificant story. It's a tiny group of people going to a tiny plot of land still within the borders of Persia, still under the control of Persia. It's, it's meaningless compared to the conquest of the Persian Empire and the administration of the empire and the alliances that the empire created and the succession of kings. It's meaningless compared to the wars between Persia and Greece. They don't care. Why, why should we care? We should care because in Ezra, God is revealing a part of the story that he's writing in the fabric of reality. God is displaying his sovereign control over everything that happens in the story. 
God is revealing one of the themes that will repeat itself over and over again until it culminates in the person of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our God, the Savior of God's elect. And God is showing how His story includes and exalts people considered utterly insignificant by the rest of the world, yet chosen and precious in the sight of God. Will you join God in His story? Will you humble yourself before God and be exalted by God? Or will you oppose God to try to create your own story and be destroyed by the creator and sustainer of all things, the author and finisher of all things. Again, John Calvin wrote, the whole world, this was before Shakespeare said, all the world's a stage. The whole world is a theater for the display of the divine goodness, but the church is the orchestra, the most conspicuous part of it. Rejoice and be content to play one instrument, whatever it may be, in God's orchestra. Rejoice in the story that God is writing and rejoice that you are called to be a part of it. Let's pray together. Our Lord and our God, who is worthy of these things? No one but your Son. Lord, we cannot save ourselves, much less can we save the world. We are utterly dependent upon you for your grace. Lord, we thank you for rescuing us from our darkness, from our sin, and bringing us into the kingdom of your Son. Lord, as your story continues to unfold in time, help us to wait patiently and to serve obediently, knowing the end that you have decreed, even when we can't see the path before us. Help us to trust you in all things, to believe you, to obey you in all things, to endure all things, to overcome all things, in dependence upon you. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.